about some examples. I'm going to talk. Oh, sorry, the computer just said something to me. Um, I'm going to talk about some examples today of, of you know economics, et cetera. They're going to be from climate zone six, seven. Anything I talk about is obviously applicable to the whole state of Colorado. You can just think that things will be about five to 10% better in terms of economics for the heat pumps in the milder zones. So a lot of you might or might not be familiar with um, the energy use, heating energy use distribution in Colorado. This is for the Eagle, Eagle bins. This is the percentage of annual energy use on the vertical left axis. And this is outdoor temperature from minus 20 up to 62. And one thing to notice in the milder where the old classic heat pumps was only about one third of our heating. Now where the cold climate heat pumps excel from 35 down to 15 is another 49%. So you're already up to over 80%. And basically in this, this final zone here where it's really cold, we think we use a lot of our energy, we don't. Um, as an area where the mini splits and a lot of them can go all the way down here, but typically if you're pairing this with uh, with uh, backup electrical or, or dual fuel, you know, you've got some of that running in here. But the, the nice thing with these, they can basically take the bulk 80 to 90 percent of the heating very efficiently. So let's talk about the technologies and the different configurations and how you might think about it for new homes. So there's you know, three configurations of the technology. There's the whole house ducted systems. Basically, it's a reversible air conditioner. Um, there's mini split, multi-zone. I think most of you are probably very familiar with these. Uh, just point out a couple of things for those who aren't. I mean, it used to be just the old wall units. Now they have some really nice slick recessed ceiling units. And I call these mini ducted mini split where basically they have these nice slim ducts that you could put in attics. You can put above closets, you can put above hallways. And the nice thing with this is you can zone a couple of rooms off of that, one thermostat, but it's nice because if you got a couple bedrooms next to each other, um, a couple offices, you can basically out of one unit, get a couple rooms. So it helps cut down the number of units and do more of the house. Finally, there's air to water heat pumps. Um, these have been around a while. Uh, mostly these are in Canada, though. The ones that are available in the U.S., there's uh, about five or six manufacturers. They've been actually used in Canada quite a bit. Um, they're basically for radiant floor, and we normally pair them with a, some kind of a boiler system because of their, their capacity limits, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how those might be applied. So these are sort of the tools. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the impact and how these might change on the thinking. Um, so if you, if gas is uneconomical, you know, your builder's not going to put it on site, the homeowner, uh, or it's, it's just not available in my mind, that could be different for things, but I just think in terms of it's 10, greater than 10 K for a gas line, chances are you might not be doing it. So let's, let's look at the comparison here in the past. It was okay. We don't have gas. We're going to throw propane on propane's cheapest to heat. It's inexpensive to cook fireplaces and we can run backup generators. Electric is more expensive. Well, now the paradigm's kind of flipped with the with a lot of the new technologies, including heat pumps. You know, you have heat pumps you can combine with things. You have water heating, uh, heat pump water heaters, which now both cost less more than propane. You've got different cooking options. You've got some fireplace, different options there. And backup, while not, quite as good as batter as a generator you've got you know you now you compare backup batteries with the solar for longer term you know on the order of a couple of days or without solar for very short term um, so you've got those options and so the result is it's almost like now the we're going to go electric as a default and how you know if we want to fit propane back into the system for various um, activities that customers want cooking, et cetera, then how's that go? And you can basically, you know, either eliminate propane, depends on what your customer wants, or you can reduce the dependence on it. And this just shows how things have changed. Now electric, the current cost about three bucks a thermal electric, propane about 230, you know, less. And a cold climate air source heat pumps, we're looking at about 
a dollar a therm, so quite a bit less than the propane. Uh, oh, sorry, let me go back. <clears throat> the button wasn't moving. So let's let's first talk about the simplest scenario. We have a home, um, no gas, propane or electric are the choices. What's what's economical? What makes sense? So the first choice is we can just go and put a propane furnace in, and and this is uh, in the mountains. This is about a five ton design load. Houses, you know, twenty four hundred square feet, new house, a lot a lot bigger depending on your insulation. So you know, just to, this is to just get you in the ballpark about two thousand gallons a year. Well, if we pair this with a propane furnace and we transition over at fifteen degrees, um, we save quite a bit on the fuel. And we save quite a bit on the propane. The other option is we could go with an all air, all electric air system, um, with a with a heat pump with integrated electrical resistance in the back. Again, saving a lot of savings, um, and and electric, you know, the changeover is around 15 degrees. So how does that play out if up front? Well, and to throughout the talk, I'm just trying to get in the ballpark of prices for initial cost. I mean, it's all over the place. Everybody knows there's wide variation. It's just, I'm like, can I get to some median that sort of makes sense? And in the end with these savings, it doesn't you know, matter a lot if things are a little bit one way or the other. So you have uh, a propane or electric furnace at 12 and a half. I can put in a combo, a hybrid system for 23. I can get uh, a rebate. Uh, well, I can so those are these are the two baselines. Sorry, baseline one, baseline two is with the AC. So what are my options? I can throw a heat pump and a propane furnace in for about a little bit more than just the propane, the AC, but I've got some rebates. So if I'm comparing against this option, I get immediately saving immediately and I start saving a couple grand a year. Um, in four to six years, if I'm if if the customer says, well, I don't need cooling. Still, it makes sense. It's four to six years, and then over the lifetime of the equipment, 15 years, they're going to save a couple grand a year. All electric, pretty much the same, a little nicer rebate on Holy Cross and all electric homes, um, a little less savings, but the same situation. And this is with current NG prices, propane, and, and electric. So the next slide is probably the toughest one. Uh, and this was the one I had most difficulty trying to think about and i know a lot of folks in colorado radiant is is premium they want radiant it's the most comfortable top of the line system and that's what we've been doing for a long time um, but i think with all the new technologies in the air side i'm going to say the comfort levels are converging not saying that air is as good as radiant now but the difference is I think in the air between the old air and the new air are significant. And let's just sort of go through the four, the four complaints or the four things where people say, a customer says radiant, air quality. And I you know, hear this a lot. No blowing dust and dirt. It's better air. My home cleans feet, feels cleaner. Well, in the old house, in the, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever, one east, you know, one PSC motor blowing high velocity air, blowing things around, basic filtering. Now, you know, you've got, we've got electrostatic, we've got HEPA, we've got all kinds of filters. We can integrate an HRV in the house for fresh air when you need it. And, and also the, the fans are, are running lower, so you don't have this blowing. So you've got, in terms of indoor air quality, um, a very high level uh, with the new air. Sound, again, a lot of this is, is all tied together, obviously. I, you know, I had one or two feet speed fans, the air stuff, the air noise at the vents would go from very loud to less. Um, of course, if you had a really well-designed system, you know, you, you could minimize this. Now with the EC adjusting, ECM adjusting fans, lower velocity air, more continuous, um, you've got a lot quieter system. Energy efficiency, the distribution with radiant used to be, you know, known as more energy efficient. Now, you know, I've got, I've got heat pumps. I've got the design of the heat pumps. I've got, you know, in a new home, I've got the ability to design better ducts, insulate them. I can improve the efficiency 
And overall with these technologies, you know, I've got better energy efficiency. And finally, the big one, the elephant in the room, thermal comfort, you know, room by room zoning, warm floors, can't get away from that, beautiful, um, versus one thermostat in the middle of a house or two. Now we can put four zones in a house, you know, typically you're gonna have two thermostats upstairs and downstairs, or with many splits, you can even get more zones. And, and the electronic controls are keeping a much narrower Delta T. So you've got uh, a much more comfortable, steady situation. So I think a lot of customers still have in their mind this situation versus this situation. And where that's gonna come into play in new construction is, we'll, we'll talk about it is, customers have in a way conflicting priorities and how do we handle it? So the conflicting priorities in a way are, I want rating in floor heating, but I also want to have an all electric house or I wanna have very high level of energy efficiency. So how can we marry these technologies together um, and make it affordable? Is it possible? Um, well, one of, one of the first things, and I'll talk a little more about them, um, show some examples of the economics is you can install a hybrid system. You can do a boiler with the air to water, cold climate heat pump. And this is actually, you know, done quite a bit in Canada. Um, and the, the reason, you know, pretty much you're going to have to pair it because I said in the altitudes, you've got some capacity limitations. But I think in the, this is something the current state right now, hopefully in the future, in a few years, there's much better technology over in Europe and the in Japan with higher capacities, more fully integrated systems, but they're not quite here yet. The other option, which a lot of people are looking at and considering it, it's a very viable um, choice, is you split the home. And the radiant heating system is on the main floor. It's the floors they live in a lot. It's the kitchen. It's where they want to, want to be. But then in the upstairs, either the bedroom wing, second floor, where now in a lot of, a lot of Colorado, they do want cool. You can go with an air source heat pump, a ducted or a mini split, put a little electric floor warming in the bathrooms or run the, or run the hydronics up there. And so you've got one, you know, one half of the house is, is less energy efficient, optimal comfort. The other is very energy efficient. And in a way, um, they're comfortable for sleeping and, and what they do up there. Now, you know, it's in the end, customer's king, but this is, uh, a, a very appealing option to some category of folks. Larger homes, ground source heat pumps, I did them for 10 years, love them. You know, they're kind of the premium, um, but it's expensive to drill in the mountains. I think all of you know that. I'm not gonna go into details, but ground source heat pumps, capacity stays up when it's really cold. They have plenty of capacity for radiant. So you can do just pure flat out ground source heat pump with some buffer tanks, or you can go with a hybrid option. And, uh, you know, for those folks who are building, building the big luxury home and uh, money might not be as much of an obstacle, it's certainly something worth, worth considering. Smaller homes is interesting if they have less than three ton, because then these, these uh, air to water heat pumps actually do have enough capacity to handle it with a buffer tank and some electrical in the buffer tank. I don't recommend it for bigger homes because then you're gonna, with that capacity, well, you can do multiple systems, the cost goes up, but you're gonna depend a lot on the electrical in the, in the buffer tank. So the cost could run into being a problem. So let's look at some options. Again, we're, not, we're off no natural gas, we're against a propane boiler, similar size load as before. Um, the savings are nice pairing it, not quite as much as, as all air because the efficiency is a bit lower. Um, or you go electric boiler, which uh, I don't know how many people are doing that, you know, obviously very expensive. Um, and you get more savings there. I have it where, you know, you're flipping over about 20 degrees because of capacity. Again, here the choice, you know, if I put an electric boiler and here's the, the hybrid model, um, nice rebates good savings, still six to eight years. Worst case, you know, you're under 10 years. So some, some of the clients, that's a long time. Um, other clients, seven, six to eight years is, is very acceptable. Electric boiler, um, 
All electric homes, rebates are nice. Holy Cross, they're really uh, good. So, you know, it's a, it's a bit uh, faster payback in this strategy. So I know all of you, a lot of you are probably like, well, fine, what about natural gas? And I mean, natural gas is inexpensive and it, and it, it's a lot less to heat a home with natural gas than with heat pumps. Um, but, you know, some homeowners, why do they even want to consider? Why would you consider it? And, and why are they asking about it? Because they are calling asking. About it. Well, there's, there's two groups of customers right now. Neither of them are, are, are giant, but they're growing. One is one that really wants an all-electric home. They want healthy indoor air quality. They don't want to have, you know, gas in the house safety. That's customer A. Customer B likes indoor air quality and safety. They're not as quite like I have to get it all out, but they want to reduce their emissions. Like so they have they have these same drivers, but maybe to a different degree. So what can we do? that makes sense, that's not gonna break the bank or that they'll, they'll consider. So for most, for small homes, um, it actually makes sense to, you can look at just putting in a heat pump system. This will be mostly air, but for very small, and you can, it makes sense to look at uh, mini splits or a small ducted system because often the, you know, if you don't have gas at all, that monthly, uh, fee, which doesn't seem like a lot, will add up, then offset most of this differential. I just looked at some places down in New Mexico, which has gas at about mm, half of our price, and did it for a very small place. And it turned out with the connection fee, it was pretty much a break even. So that is, that's one scenario. The other scenario is people want cooling and Normally we're running out, we're quoting AC, 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 and rather than saying, well, let's start quoting cold climate heat pumps. Well, why would you want to do that? First of all, it's pretty cheap insurance against, against gas changes. And gas has been going down and steady the whole time. You know, we has unexpected jumps with natural disasters, basically. They're short-lived, but, but there's reason that gas could go up again. So you've got that. Um, you don't have, and I'll show you the next slide, the upfront cost of the rebates about a wash. And it gives customers, also some customers their ability to pay a little more if they wanna, if they wanna decrease their gas use, if they wanna contribute a little less emissions. So similar kind of house, put a gas furnace in. And here, this is kind of the hybrid mode where, okay, no AC, we're going to heat pump. So you, depending on the outdoor temperature and the cost, this is the current prices, they can choose to cut their gas use down. Um, they can choose to pay a little. And you, you as a contractor, you know, you gotta decide if you wanna get into all this game, but it's pretty, pretty simple, I think, at this point to say, well, you know, it's very mild. Heat pumps are very efficient, super efficient down to mid forties. I can set your switch over the forties. It's gonna cost you, a uh, hundred bucks divided by 12, you know, five, five or 10 bucks a month more to heat on the average, but you're going to cut, cut your gas use down by 15% or so. Um, and then, you know, as gas prices, if they do go up in the next 15 years, might or might not, then, then these customers have the ability to adjust or they might decide to just pay a little more. Um, given the upfront costs, it's, it's pretty good with the rebates. This is a, uh, you know, obviously versus a gas furnace, this all hinges on cool. It's just a gas furnace. You know, I, I'm not gonna say they're gonna ever save money, they're not. Um, but if you, it's against AC, notice over here, the price ranges are with rebates, heat pumps could be a little less, about the same, a tiny bit more. Um, these are the rebates. This is if you use it for 80% or more. So that would be in the case here, but if not still, still same price. So um, a good option for Colorado. So a lot of the home, a lot of the homeowners, the builders, some of the developers, I'll show one in a minute or show a slide about developers thinking. Um, you know, they're looking at this. This is holy costs with the CO2 emissions levels at um, 2020. And 
This is for the different technologies. This line to just give you a baseline if somebody ran out and spent money on an electric car versus their average vehicle, which you know, you're looking at 30,000 up in price. Um, so let's see what happens by 20, I put 2027, but basically this is when we get to 80% renewable, which, um, you know, Holy Cross has 100% uh, by 2030, Excel has 80% by 2030. So sometime in the next 10 to 12 years, the grid's gonna be doing, most grids will be doing this in our state. Um, and notice that the heat pumps, obviously, however you pair together are gonna be way down. Um, and this, you know, this kind of presentation or information, a lot of, a lot of um, customers will really care about this. So are the developers starting to think, I mean, you all deal with many builders. So, you know, I'm just throwing, this was a little report done recently by Sweep. They kind of went around and said, uh, who's doing this kind of stuff? And they came up with some examples of, and I'm not going to go through this because I want to keep on time, but basically, uh, you know, there's some examples, cold climate heat pumps in the front range. I don't know if it's going to start happening up in the high country, but some of the developers are just looking at, let's, let's bite the bullet. Let's just go out. Let's drill bore holes. Everything's set up. It's part of our utility infrastructure as opposed to putting in gas lines. And then that's how we're going to do it. In fact, when I was doing heat pumps, geothermal about uh, 12 years ago, we did it. You know, we, <clears throat> there was a couple up in Fort Collins. We looked at the same strategy. It's a pretty effective strategy depending on the drilling situation. Um, so in the next few slides, we're going to talk about some design thoughts, also some installation thoughts. Some of this, you know, probably you guys, everybody knows pretty much like the back of their hand, but you know, manual J, D rate for altitude. Um, a couple things about the heat pumps I mentioned that, you know, there's a drop off in capacity, um, even though they're, they're much better than they used to be, about five degrees of the mini splits. The interesting thing is the heating curve for, you know, the cold climate heat pumps, depending on the brand, they have different drop offs. They're good, but, but it is notable. So you want to be very cognizant of that when you're designing. Um, and I'd say when in doubt, go with a larger unit. We don't want to massively oversize, but typically it's a half ton or a ton. The reason is with the turndown, you're really not using much energy in the mild temperatures, but you, you know, it, you, it's a big difference if you're sort of keeping that propane, especially with propane or electrical backup, if you're using that less, it can make a difference. Check the rebate requirements. Holy Cross has certain ones. Excel has certain ones. Um, tri-state, different tri-state um, co-ops have certain requirements. I want to make sure the, comp the uh, equipment matches the specs. So you have a manufacturer and a paired systems usually requirement. So some talk about electrical. This is becoming very important and a topic that comes up a lot. Where all of a sudden, a home's going heating electric, uh, water electric, everything electric. And so sometimes it's been coming up more and more. All right, the panels have to be upsized. It's, it, it's a big, it's a big hit. And it's, and it's a barrier. So there's strategies around it. I mean, with electric strip, um, be thoughtful about oversizing the backup. The past was just, hey, I'm, you know, if this compressor goes out for four days, this thing better be able to carry the load at minus five. You know, and there's little trade-offs. Does it really need to carry the load at minus five? Or if you go from a 20 kW to a 15 kW, is that good enough? That's one strategy. The other one is to actually decide on these various other technologies. If if I pull a water heater off the electrical and that's gonna, gonna help me to not have to up the whole panel, I can go to on-demand outdoor gas. I can do some different thing. Is the dryer something I can pull off? So there's sort of trade-offs. I have a heat pump and uh, pretty much electric home, energy efficient, but I, I, I pay extra every month for my dryer because I don't want to upgrade my panel. So just little trade-offs like that to be, just to be aware of. Um, duct systems, um, there's a couple things with heat pumps. So the output temperature of the air of the heat pump is less. And I'll tell you in my, my heat pump and most of them, uh, 
it doesn't feel cold. It just feels neutral. It doesn't feel warm. It just, you just feel the air. You don't say that's warm or cold. But we, with the new homes, we're gonna have to be really careful and really thoughtful about, you know, you want it, you're gonna wanna insulate the ducts good. And I think the biggest thing is try to avoid super long duct runs, especially in unconditioned spaces. And if there's ducts, you have to go into unconditioned spaces. You really wanna insulate them well. Uh, you know, recently I heard a story, someone put in a heat pump, um, actually a rep from one of the companies and said, it was a little difficult in his old house because the ducts aren't insulated well and they had a long duct run. So it actually resulted in some of the places feeling a little bit cold. So with a new home, we don't have to have that situation. Um, also, you know, the ducts need to be designed a little bit bigger for the heat pumps. Um, mini splits, a couple things um, real quick. You know, both outdoor and indoor, you got to look at for derating. Um, a lot, of the better, some of the better technology, the outdoor units can compensate for altitude. You got to, if you're going to just use mini splits, you got to make sure they can go, you know, you got to design for the low temps. Um, you want to try to balance the zones. And I would really recommend using the manufacturer's design software and get used to that because especially with multi-zone, um, they figure out that at a really cold temperature, it's not necessary that all the zones are going to be calling at once. So you can kind of, from the same outdoor unit, get a little more capacity out by, by switching. <clears throat> uh, the indoor units are switching modes a lot. Uh, air to water. Um, I mentioned this before, singular unit, derated, you're going to be at about three and a half tons. This is really important on these is the design of the radiant in-floor, even more so than, than with boilers, uh, but these are entering water temperatures. So for about every 10 degrees up um, that your, that your uh, floor requires, you're gonna lose about 10% capability, COP. So <clears throat> you would really want it designed for, for really low, as low as low water temperatures. Um, there's a couple of options in terms of the technology, uh, mono blocks, Basically, the refrigerant cycle is all in the outdoor, and you run glycol water into the into the buffer tank. So it's just basically all plumbing related, no refrigerant required, no refrigerant handling. Um, and then there's obviously the split units. That's another option too. So you'll see these configurations. Like I said, go to the appendix and and talk to these folks. Um, you know this. Um, a little bit of just some of this is common sense and uh, but it doesn't hurt to emphasize you know I don't, I don't want to be I don't want to get this call like come shovel out my heat pump because you didn't put it up high enough uh, and there are winds there's wind chill effects and you have some you know you've got some defrosting it helps to keep it out of the wind chill to try to put you know the southeast corner is a nice corner um, avoid the north um, the snow height, if you read in a lot of literature, they sort of give standard like 12 inches, 18 inches up there looking at the average snow depth. I, I would do them higher. I look at the average snow depth for the maximum month. You know, Vail is 31 inches. Um, but, but, you know, y'all are more experienced, but up in the high country, but that would be sort of my guy. And this stuff uh, is pretty much just good quality install. Um, so what's, so, this is just trying to give everyone an overview of the tools and how these can be integrated and what's the cost and what, make, what makes sense. Um, you know, this stuff works, but you do, you know, and, it, and there, it provides just a lot more opportunities for customers that are learning and want more. Um, a lot of the customers up in Holy Cross, you know, this might be a tool for them. They care about different things, health and safety and their missions. Um, and I think the rebates and the, you know, the towns, everything is moving in this direction. Um, and fuel switching is starting to become uh, a possibility. Uh, it used to be there are you know, laws and barriers to allowing um, utilities to help support fuel switching, but that philosophy is changing. And it's, it, I'm not gonna read this, but AHRI, this is just out of their recent report. I mean, the sales are starting to really go. So, um, so some final thoughts. You know, is now a time to start really thinking about offering these and putting them in. It's going to take some more time. You know, it's a little harder to do. Um, it might be 
you might be able to be distinguished from your competitors on their bids. Um, I would really get to know one product client super well. Um, there are nuances, especially in the control system and the setups that that's sort of what's going to bite you on some of the first installs if you don't really got that down. Um, the software is quite good. Customers like the rebates. A word of caution, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on the pricing and looking online and, you know, there's a lot of rebranding from quality manufacturers online now and, and, and especially in the mini splits, the pricing differences are crazy. But if you dig in and say, well, all right, this product line is made by Cree out of China, it was good, but you investigate, you say, well, man, I don't think they got spare parts in the U.S. And I'm really not sure who's standing behind the warranty. So that's just the word of caution. Um, and that's over. I'm over time, but uh, thanks for your time. And that's, here's some information locally. And in the appendix, there's a information on how to get more training. Um, there's a training sponsored by Excel tomorrow morning. So if you want to, uh, I can pull that up later and show you if you want to sign up for that too. Uh, thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us. We really appreciate it. That was really great information. And so I just want to talk about some local rebates. Um, so I obviously I work for Holy Cross and we have rebates. Um, we also have a lot of educational information that we really work with our members to try to get them informed so they can make informed decisions. I know you, a lot of you guys are really good experts. So if you want to share some of your advice with us, we'd love to hear it. So I just want to um, kind of give a what our rebates are because they're a little confusing. So if the new home is not going to bring in any gas or propane, our rebate would be $850 per ton. So, and we all know that he pumps our size by British Thermal Unit BTU. So one ton equals 12,000 BTU. So um, we, we're seeing mainly, I would say, uh, probably three to five ton units being installed. So if there's absolutely no gas, um, except for if you can't talk them out of their stove, um, we'll let that slide. But um, if all the heating and the water heating, space heating and water heating is going to be electric, that would be a $850 rebate. We give a $1,450 rebate for a heat pump water heater. Um, if they are going to do the dual system and have gas as a backup, then that would be a $600 per ton rebate. Um, our partners uh, at Nikki Walking Mountain Science Center, so they run in the Eagle Valley, which is Vale de Dot Cerro, and they have some really, really wonderful rebates. And so um, there's the, um, you can check their website for that. Um, CORE now, the Community Office of Resource Efficiency, which now does Picken County, and the Eagle Pony, part of Roaring Fork Valley. And if you don't live in this area, I know it's really confusing. It took me, I think, eight years to learn all this, but they have some good rebates too. Um, I will say our partners are all about electrifying. So we really are partnering with them. And then Garfield Clean Energy, Clear um, are doing just Garfield County. So there are some rebates for those people in the Glenwood Springs Muni. And then Myasa is your contact. And then the next, is there one more slide? Dave. <laughs> and then we'll go to questions. I'm not sure. And then that's just the lat that's Dave's contact information down on the right hand corner. And then we will start with some questions. So Dave, I know that in our other um, talks that we had back in January, we talked about the global warming potential of the refrigerants. So we, even though the grid is going green, what about the refrigerants? Do you still have that in the appendix? Oh uh, yeah, I do. That, Actually, yeah, it's, so is that a trade -off, It's a big so. deal, it's in the appendix. Um, well, right now that, that, that's being addressed. In fact, there was an announcement this week that there, it's down here, you can read it, about a big phase out. And um, the manufacturers are working very rapidly on that. And I think that, in fact, I was reading, you can see that there's going to be, you know, a big drop in that. Um, so we're in a transition time. Um, I wouldn't not buy them right now because 
actually, according to law, you have to capture your if when you get rid of dispose of a um, device like this, you're supposed to capture all the refrigerant and 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 basically they they recycle it. So certainly not an ideal situation, um, but it's something that that. Uh, the technologies are changing. We do have the ability to, to design and make new um, refrigerants that are going to be a lot less harmful to the environment. So, mm -hmm. um, yep. you know, at the moment, I think it's, this is, this is the change time and we got to try to change over and, and uh, <clears throat> people are pretty careful about the refrigerants now. It's been, a, it's been many years. You, you can get in trouble for not handling refrigerants correctly. Right, right. And Colorado actually requires anybody dealing with refrigerants, which is any, with the heat pumps has to be certified. So that's great. Um, are there cold weather heat pumps with outside condensers for hot water? So for water heating? No, no, there's not. I mean, there's stand the, the heat pump water heaters made by the big ones are just trying to, they're basically making a packaged unit the heat pumps on top. Um, in a new home though, I would just, I think you can do a good job putting those in without worrying about, it. basically you put it in the mechanical room. It has to be a big enough space. So there's air exchange. The main thing you have to be cognizant of is not having that air dump out and right into a living space that you, you know, are going to be in and uncomfortable. So, you know, you could put it have it go out in a hallway where you're just transitioning, um, things like that. But no, there's the, the, that's not the way they're going right now. Yeah. And I have seen some ducted heat pumps, water heaters in very small closets. So you can do it. You have to get created with the duct work. And I would say that there is a CO2 hot water uh, called Sandin, S-A-N-D-E-N, -E that Aspen Skiing Company is putting into their employee housing. So more for a multifamily kind of unit type of thing. So they are starting to create some more um, heat pump water heaters that are going to be really efficient. So what brand of mini split would you recommend? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm supposed to say, no, I don't I mean, I know Mitsubishi is very good. Daikin's very good. Um, Samsung, but you know, the top four, Samsung's very good. Um, Fujitsu, uh, Daikin. Me. Fujitsu. I mean, I have a list here. These Bosch. Are, Bosch uh, is another really one we're seeing in our yeah, territory. Um, in the appendix, I have a list of the top four um, for the nice ones. Where is it? Up, up, up. I mean, these are the, and, and well, here's the important thing is to make sure that you, uh, can everyone see this still? I hope, uh, make sure you get their cold climate yes. series, right? And that's yes. what those are. Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, I've had to deny some rebates recently because they've been put in the standard. And so you really got to make sure we really want the heating seasonal performance factor greater than 10. We want it being rated to minus 13. So a lot of the ones that were installed were um, down to five degrees, which isn't considered cold climate. And if you really have any questions, you know, we say just call either Rocky Mountain Science Center or us and we can look at it. We, we will even call the manufacturer to confirm that. So um, with Mitsubishi, they're called hyperheat. So that, here's a really good question. Okay, is it possible <laughs> that the air source could work in a larger home, like two to 3,000 square feet, that super efficient high performance house. They're putting in a CERV, which is a conditioning energy recovery ventilator, which is something kind of new, a balanced ventilation system with these heat pumps, along mm -hmm. with a backup inflow radiant. So also experiment with a minotaur with greater heating capacity. So that's oh, a really sure. Good question. I mean, absolutely. If you have a very I mean, it depends on your load, but it sounds like in this case, your load's going to be three tons, three and a half tons. So you absolutely could put in a heat pump. You, you know, the, the air, the, I don't know if you, so you said you had backup radiant. I mean, you could probably potentially drive that radiant with uh, the air to water heat pump. Um, you could, depending on the specifics, you could do the approach where you do some air in the second floor and, and radiant the first floor. So yes. 
the answer is yes. And if, if you want more specifics, uh, if you want to talk more about your house, just feel free to email, email me, please. Okay. At what efficiency is it better to use an air source heat pump with solar photovoltaic PV for domestic hot water compared to solar drain back hot water with maybe an electric element or gas for backup? Um, actually, I, I, I don't know. the answer. <laughs> Yeah, I really, I really don't. I honestly, I haven't, I haven't, um, done that comparison. My only, and the only answer I can give relative to that is if, is if you're doing the solar PV for lots of other things in your house, um, then I would, I would think hard about whether you want to have a solar thermal system another so semi-complicated system in your home for just domestic hot water. So mm -hmm. that, that, but mm -hmm. in terms of just flat out A versus A, uh, I haven't really looked at that. I, I, I couldn't give you the answer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the new homes I know being built that are all electric, when you combined it with solar PV, especially if you have the heat pump water heater, which is super efficient, and then some kind of whichever heat pump you decide on, and then you add the photovoltaic, the PVs on your roof. I mean, you are going to have pretty small utility bills. And we've seen that. I mean, those are what we kind of, you know, call the net zero homes. And so um, Holy Cross offers really generous rebates. Walking Mountains offers rebates for solar. Um, do you do that on new construction too, Nikki? Are you guys offering rebates on solar and new construction? No new construction. No. I, okay, just, but Holy Cross does. Yep. Yeah. I do seem to recall someone telling me that um, it was a solar solar guy I was talking to that I think it's they add after add if they want to cover domestic hot water, it's two more solar panels mm -hmm. on the PV. Yeah. So I don't think it it's depends. a lot. Yeah. It's not a lot, it, especially if it's a heat pump water heater and you keep it on the yeah. heat pump mode. Yeah. It's not yeah. that much. So yeah, we look at the load. You know, in Colorado, you can size your system to 120% of your annual kilowatt hour usage. And when it's a new home, we look at basically what, what the estimated usage is going to be in that home and, and let you size it that way. Um, and, then, and then if you want to add an electric vehicle, we allow another two kilowatt system to go with that electric vehicle. And by the way, we give away free EV chargers if you're thinking about really going all electric in your life. Um, does your cost numbers reflect the advantage that all electric homes does not have the cost to bring gas to the building or the cost of piping in the piping to the building? So basically the gas pipeline. Uh, cost analysis. No. no, they don't. They don't. I mean, against propane or electric doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. The gas, it, you know, the gas, um, they don't. And, it, and that could be game changer. It really depends on the the cost to do all to do all that you know that's why i said that's why at the beginning i have this my number is kind of it's going to cost 10 grand to bring in gas in like that's kind of my number where well that can pay for a lot of a lot of equipment mm -hmm. but um right it, it, that's just on a case-by-case -case basis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and I've seen anything, I've seen homeowners tell me that the gas of the pipeline was going to be anywhere from 20 to 40,000. So it does, sometimes it just does make sense to go all electric. Yeah, I so. mean, if you just subtract off the number from the upfront cost, you could still look at the operating cost comparison and, and do it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you please talk about the viability of a heat pump retrofit for an existing gas propane in-floor radiant system? Are there any concerns to be aware of? Yeah, the, the biggest concern is the design of the in-floor radiant system and what your entering water temperature needs to be. So there would be a big difference if that system's designed for say 120 entering water temperature versus 110, because uh, if you remember in that one slide, for every 10 degrees, you lose 10% on the on the um, efficiency. And the other is whether not. So I would just say you can look at a hybrid system for an existing home. So I would just um, you can look in that list. Um, 
and call someone up or you can drop me an email, but really it just comes down to the design of your existing system, how much energy you use, how big it is. So whether a heat pump would help you enough is really the, the, the question. You know, if it's if your system requires a lot of juice and a higher temperature, the heat pump's not going to help. It's a little if it can be modified a little lower temperature. Um, it's not that big of a, a of a of a uh, load. The heat pump could help a fair amount. So um, mm -hmm. feel free to drop me a line, and I and I can hook you up with some of these folks. Dave, do you want to show us that slide with your uh, email address again, so everybody can see that? We will send these slides out in the follow up, and we will also send out the recording of this <laughs> webinar. I do apologize; we missed the first couple minutes in the recording because. I simply forgot to push record, um, but you'll have the slides and most of the recording and um, we'll send you uh, links to Holy Cross Energy and all that kind of stuff. So you can look at those rebates as well. Anybody have any other questions? We have a few more minutes and Dave's happy to have a conversation or ask a few more questions. If there's anything anyone um, really wants to talk about, let us know. Or if anybody has any lessons learned that we all can learn from that, really that good knowledge good to too that's yeah. always great so feel free to yeah. raise your hand and we can unmute you and dave if you want to maybe show us uh the end of the webinar where you have all your appendix and um let people oh, yeah, know there's a good. big yeah, appendix Eric. back there oh i should bring this up if i don't know if anybody's left on but if you want to go to excel training there's a video here but this link tomorrow morning they have a training class it's a little bit late but they're having heat pump training tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, assistant weatherization, this, this talks about that. There's some good financing options. Um, the PURE program, this is uh, ducted heat pump systems. And this kind of gives you the those uh, series that are in that 10 and 10, 11 um, HSPF. This is the mini splits. This is the information on uh, the uh, air to water, a little bit of lot floor warming, radiant update, and this is the Vermont study. So there's some information in the appendix that might might be of help to you. So the slides will be more valuable than just the simple presentation that Dave gave us. So keep that in mind. He has some good information in there if you need to reference it. Any last minute questions or lessons learned that anybody would like to share with us? And uh, will you publish the PowerPoint presentation was a question. Yes, we will send you these slides. It will probably be in a PDF format and we'll email those to you in the follow-up. And we will actually put on YouTube in a private group, um, the recording. So, and it might not actually be a private group, I'll correct myself, but it is just a specific group all with a bunch of videos that we've done here at Walking Mountain. So that will also be available to you. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder that both the uh, Walking Mountains, actually all core, clear Walking Mountains, Holy Cross, we all have contractor lists on our website too. And we definitely are looking for input from you contractors because we're looking at trying to design a preferred installer list for heat pumps so that we make sure that we're getting quality installations and um, getting a good reputation out there for these heat pumps. So if you have any input on what you feel we should be looking for in our contractors to put them on our preferred installer list, we would really appreciate that feedback too. So Andrew, it looks like you're wondering, you say you have a specific sizing question, who should I contact? I would email Dave. Um, Dave, if you don't mind, is that okay? We'll connect no, you fine. right yeah, now. Email me, we'll, so we'll Dave's email address it. is on the screen there, Andrew. Um, so feel free to jot that down. It will also be in the follow-up email and on these slides so you'll have access to it but um, he loves discussing these kind of things I think <laughs> <laughs> and I will say sizing is so important so and that's a requirement for the rebates now you have to show some kind of a load calculation it's not just putting your thumb up and saying I think you need a four ton unit no yeah if you, you go have to look at yeah Two slides, Dave, so everybody can see those requirements for Holy Cross real quick before you get off the line. Um, the red in the bottom right, those are the heat pump requirements there from Holy Cross. And those are the same kind of requirements we require if it's a retrofit too. Um, so just like, like he mentioned and Mary mentioned, be sure to check your requirements um, with whoever you're looking for a rebate for from. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, and we're happy to review bids. I mean, we, we definitely want to make sure stuff is going correctly. We learn a lot from our contractors and we really appreciate all, all the work they're doing for us out in our territory. And we know the growth here is insane. So um, we know you're so busy. So thank you for spending an hour with us. Thanks everyone. Uh, don't forget on June 15th, we're gonna have another one of these new construction focused webinars about heat pumps and it's gonna be really more consumer talks. Uh, so we expect to have more homeowners uh, and property owners, but we welcome any contractors that would like to join as well. And we welcome your feedback about the presentation. And like Dave said, you're welcome to contact him anytime. So watch for a follow-up email within a few days uh, from us. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye, Have everyone. a great evening. Have a great evening.